from today's psalm, Psalm 82. How long will you judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked? Save the weak and the orphan. Defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. From today's letter to the Colossians. May you be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. From today's collect, grant that we may know and understand what things we ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. And from Luke's Gospel, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. It's always difficult to preach when the message is so obscure and hard to understand. <laughs> you really got to pay close attention. That is sarcasm. Thank you for understanding. The challenge in these passages does not lie in their complexity or their theological intricacy. The lawyer asks Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And we already know the answer. Love God immensely and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. No, the challenge in today's message lies in its very simplicity and bluntness. Love everyone with everything you've got, period. Simple and direct, like a hot sun that beats down on your head when you hike through a meadow with no shade. <laughs> Relentless and unwielding, unyielding. Because who really does that? Who loves that extravagantly or that indiscriminately or that consistently at all times? No one I know. Like the lawyer, with Jesus, who among us has not tried to parse these words and this message in the hopes of maybe discovering a, a loophole to justify our own inaction in the love thy neighbor department, to excuse our own behavior or preferences? With the lawyer, we might ask the clarifying question, so Jesus, who exactly is my neighbor? <laughs> By which we mean, who is not my neighbor? Whom specifically do I have to love? And then where can I draw the line? Where can I make a border of compassion that I do not have to cross so that my way of life, my political affiliations, my retirement accounts remain intact? And I'm still saved. <laughs> Jesus answers both the lawyer and us with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, because you've heard this story many times, I will just point out a few salient details. The man who is robbed is the only character in the story who is not given a defining characteristic. We have robbers, an innkeeper, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. But the wounded man is a cipher. He is no one in particular, which is to say he is anyone, which is to say he is everyone. When the priest and the Levite avoid him by crossing the road to pass by on the other side, we rightly condemn them. But if you were to ask them why they did not stop to help, their justification might be, you know, I've just spent 20 minutes making myself ritually pure so that I can go up to the temple and do God's work as my religion requires of its leaders. So rather than bloody myself by helping this beaten man, and then have to return home to start the purification process all over again and then be late for the sacrifices, I'm just going to trust that somebody else will be along soon to help him. I'm sure you understand. Now, while you non-clergy out there sit back smugly, arms crossed, and think, yep, them priests <laughs> sure do care more about church than neighbor, let me just suggest that anyone who cares more for their religious practices or their appointments that they're late for than they care about their fellow human being might be indicted here as well. 
Also note that the good guy is a Samaritan. As I'm sure you know, no love was lost between Jews and Samaritans in Jesus' day. Though they worshiped the same God, the ways by which they did so were anathema to each other. Jews and Samaritans actually had a lot in common, but they preferred to stress their differences, to show why their own particular rituals were superior. So when Jesus tells Jews a story where a Samaritan is the hero, they are appalled. It offends their perspective. It's a little like if, if you were a progressive person of color and saw like, a middle-aged white guy with a red MAGA cap helping people injured at a protest at a Supreme Court justice's house. What's that about? Or if you were a, a conservative and saw a young woman in a bright queer and proud t-shirt tending to someone who had passed out at a, at a Stop the Steal rally. They're the bad guy. Why are they doing good? Such might be the response of a first century Jew hearing the parable of the Good Samaritan. But do not miss the twin lessons in this ingenious story of Jesus. One, the robbed and beaten man is unidentified because your neighbor is anyone and everyone. And two, the man who saves his life is specifically identified as Samaritan because your neighbor might be the person you most hate. Those two lessons are the real challenge in today's readings. Everyone is your neighbor, and maybe even especially the ones you'd rather not be around. Now, political tolerance is not the point I want to make today, but this is. Time and time again, scripture requires us as children of God to perform acts of mercy and care for those in need. Boom. This call from God is a deep challenge when heard correctly, but called we are. Jonathan Sachs, the chief rabbi of the UK who died in November 2020 said that to imitate God is to be alert to the poverty, suffering, and loneliness of others. Such imitation of God was the final act in the lives of Bart Rainey, Sharon Yeager, and Jane Pounds. On June 16th, almost a month ago, at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church in Vestavia Hills, Alabama, they invited an unknown 70-year-old man sitting alone at a table during a church potluck in their parish hall to join them at their table. Instead, he pulled out a gun and killed them before being subdued by other parishioners. The rector of that parish, the Reverend John Burris, said, three of the most faithful people kept inviting this member of our community to sit with them and be with them and they loved him, and it cost them their life. And there's not a doubt in my mind that they would do it again. The parish hall where this happened was constructed in 2014. At that time, underneath the sheetrock and hardwood, fashioned to the concrete slab and steel beams, church members inscribed messages that are still there. One simply says, welcome the stranger. Their website notes that today, July 10th, at the conclusion of their 10.15 a.m. service, the parish will process into the parish hall once again to proclaim God's victory over death and to honor the parish hall as a place of healing and renewal. The scars, they say, are fresh in our memory and yet it is the scars that remind us that love is always the way, and the stranger will always be welcome. In 2008, archaeologists at Kirbet Keyafa, an ancient fortress city 20 miles from Jerusalem, unearthed a potsherd, a, a six by six and a half inch piece of clay which they dated to about the year 1020 BC. On it was an inscription written 
in a Paleo-Hebrew alphabet, a precursor to Hebrew. A professor at Haifa University looked at it and suggested this decryption of the message. He suggested that it said, you shall not do it, but worship God. Judge the slave and the widow, judge the orphan and the stranger, plead for the infant, plead for the poor and the widow, rehabilitate the poor at the hands of the king, protect the poor and the slave. Support the stranger. The great Israeli author Amos Oz said this about that message in the clay. More than 3,000 years ago, there was a culture here that saw fit to demand from the strong that they respect the weak. It demanded not only charity, tzedakah in Hebrew, but also justice, tzedek. Tzedakah, tzedek, the two words in Hebrew, unlike in other languages, are closely connected, charity and justice. It demanded this justice not only from rulers, but from every human being. Bruce Thompson, a history professor at UC Santa Cruz, notes about that potsherd. He notes that what may be the oldest text in Hebrew a pre-biblical text already contains in embryo the core principles of the Hebrew Bible, the obligation to pursue justice and the requirement that the strong and prosperous must assist the weak and vulnerable. Go and do likewise, Jesus tells us. It is an obligation of our Judeo-Christian faith and of our God that predates scripture itself. So the next time you are tempted to pass by a hand outstretched in need, remember that there is a 3,000 year old potsherd with your name written on it, and with mine too. Perhaps 3,000 years from now, someone will unearth that parish hall of St. Stephen's in Alabama and find those words, welcome the stranger. It is a message centuries old, and it carries into the future, and it will always be the same. I like to think the lawyer who questioned Jesus left that encounter a changed man, getting much more than he bargained for, receiving a directive he could no longer talk his way around, or bypass. Do this and you will live. My friends, there are no bystanders. We belong to each other. We either stop to help or we walk on by. God grant that we may know and understand what things we ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them.